Learning Objective 1-4, Understand and Explain the Differences Between Different Forms of Business Combinations. There are three different legal forms of business combinations, statutory merger, statutory consolidation, and a stock acquisition. And it, these, this is a CPA question. These are, there are CPA questions in here. So we'll go through these in some detail to understand how these work. The first kind that we'll talk about is a statutory merger. This would be a situation where all of the assets of the acquired company of the, what was the subsidiary are moved into the parent company. So all you have when you're all done is one company, you just have the parent company. So statutory merger, the parent company emerges intact and but the subsidiary, the acquired company, all of the assets of the acquired company get added to the books and the corporation of the parent company. The purchase company is going to be dissolved, liquidated, whatever. Um, a statutory consolidation would be where you create a new company and all of the assets of the, of the acquiring company and the acquired company are moved into the new parent company. So there'd be one legal entity that survives and all of the assets of A and B are both going to be a part of C. And um, it, it's not really, it's legally, it's a new corporation, but financially, um, in substance, it's really, you know, the two companies as one. And a lot of times what will happen is that they'll still operate with two sets of books and the two sets of books need to be consolidated. But legally, they'll really be one corporation. Um, a lot of times the name of the corporation is changed slightly of one of the two companies is changed slightly. For example, when AT&T merged with, I think, Southwest Communications, I'm trying to remember, SBC, I think was the name of the company. Um, it became, it went from, I think, being AT&T Corporation to AT&T Inc. So this way, internally, everybody would understand the difference between the two corporations. Then you have what's called a stock acquisition. And this would be a situation where one company buys the stock of another company. And eventually it owns a majority of the stock to where it can exert control. But the corporation it purchased is still a separate corporation. And that would create that parent subsidiary relationship that we're talking about. So under a statutory merger, there's only one corporation that emerges. Statutory consolidation, there's only one corporation that emerges. But in a stock acquisition, you would still have two separate corporations, a parent and a subsidiary. And what companies really like about the stock acquisition is that the there's limited liability in the subsidiary. So the parent is only liable for its investment in the subsidiary. So these are the three types in a nice little picture for you. So another way of doing this is simply to have an acquisition of assets. In other words, the parent would this the acquired company would simply take a bundle of assets it could be everything that it owns and trans sell it to the new parents so this could be done as a statutory merger a statutory cons consolidation it can't be done as a stock acquisition because you're not really acquiring the stock but um this could be either of those statutory mergers or consolidations because they're just taking the assets of this other company and putting them on the book of the acquiring company. Now, an acquisition of stock would be where the parent acquires a majority interest in the stock of the subsidiary. And there are other ways of doing this besides the majority of stock, but that's usually what's required. And if so, if the parent doesn't buy 100% of the subsidiary, then there's going to be what's called a non-controlling interest left. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about non-controlling interest. This would be the percentage of the subsidiary that the parent doesn't own. So if the parent owns 80% of the subsidiary, then someone else or another group of stockholders own the other 20%. And that's called the non-controlling interest. And you can think about the non-controlling interest as this group of people 
who are just there along for the ride because they may own 20% of the subsidiary, but they have no say in anything that happens. It's the parent that's going to have all the say. Now, a very important component of this is the value is valuation. How much is this acquisition going to cost? And so the company is going to need to do a detailed appraisal of all of the assets that it's acquiring. Um, whether it's buying the assets and liabilities separately or it's buying the whole company, it needs to inventory everything the company has, all of its liabilities, and determine their value. And that will be the value of the acquisition. That'll help them determine what the right price is. And the acquisition is always going to be valued at the amount of consideration given up to buy the company. It could be cash. Um, the company could borrow money and get the cash and use the cash to buy the assets. Or the company could issue its own stock. And the fair market value of that stock on the date of acquisition would be considered to be the consideration the what, I, what I'd call the acquisition cost, and that is the value of the overall acquisition. Another tool that can be used to determine what how much the company should be willing to pay is the value of potential earnings. So what the company would do, the acquiring company would do, is they would look at the profitability of the sub and project that forward and use that to determine what the real value of this subsidiary should be, how much they should be willing to pay and then use that information to set a price and then pay that amount of cash, that consideration, or pay stock or whatever it's gonna be. So valuation is very key here. If you pay too much, then you may have a problem later on. Um, that Time Warner merger that I was talking about before, um, a lot of value was incinerated it was, a, I believe it was a stock for stock merger where um, Time issued stock to buy Warner Brothers. And the value of that stock, they gave up so much stock that the existing shareholders had, they, their value had been diluted down way, way too much. So they really incinerated tons and tons of market value to make that acquisition. What you would want to do again is look at what the reasonable value of this subsidiary is going to be and then be willing to give up a certain amount of cash or a stock, your own stock, in order to make the acquisition. But if you pay too much, then that's real money that you're giving up or it's real stock that dilutes the value of the company. We'll talk about that later on too. You have to think about legal considerations because a target could have unrecorded liabilities that you don't want to be responsible for. Um, for example, if you buy a tobacco company, then you may be responsible for all of the liabilities, whether they've been that, that, that tobacco company is responsible for. When um, Bank of America bought countrywide savings, countrywide savings, had a huge mortgage division that did a lot of really bad stuff. And the federal government sued them and they were class action suits and they lost billions of dollars. Bank of America had to pay the money. Bank of America did not own Countrywide when Countrywide engaged in all this predatory lending. But nonetheless, they bought the company, they owned it when the lawsuits took place, and therefore they were responsible for billions of dollars in damages because of it. You have many other similar situations. And so if you're going to buy a company, you have to think about the legal liability associated with the company's assets. You have to think about taxes. Taxes are very important. And taxes on both sides, the seller and the buyer and how they will need to pay taxes for different um, types of deals. Now, one other thing, acquiring common stock is relatively easy. Acquiring assets is a little more complicated. If you're buying real estate, then the title to that real estate is going to change, need to be changed. And there are a lot of legal costs associated with doing that. You may have a corporation with thousands or more pieces of property and the title to all of that property needs to be changed over. 
On the other hand, if you just buy the stock, then stock can be signed over from one owner to another in a very easy way. So acquiring assets is relatively simple because when you buy the assets, you're not getting the liabilities along with them. Um, you're not getting all of the different contracts that this company is engaged in. You just so the difference is you can buy, let's say you, you could buy a factory. If you buy a factory, you're just buying a building and you're not buying, you're not bringing in the employees. Whereas if you buy the company, you're getting the factory with the employees and the employees may be part of a labor union um, that they don't have a good relationship with. Now you've inherited that relationship and you're going to need to fix it. I'm not saying you should close the fact, make them close the factory and then just buy the building and bring back the employees at a lower wage. I'm not necessarily saying that you should do that. But when you buy assets, you're not getting, you're, you're not going to get all the baggage that the company has been carrying along with it over the years. Transfer titles on real estate and other assets can be time consuming. And if you buy assets, you're not getting the contracts that go along with them. If you buy common stock, um, transferring common stock is by definition very, very easy. It can be affected in a matter of minutes. And um, there could still be non-transferable contracts. There could still be contracts that say that if the ownership of the company has changed, the contract is null and void. And so you may still have that problem. But most contracts are going to be transferable. And again, if you buy the common stock, you got all the baggage that the company has. So you've got all those contingent liabilities, all the potential lawsuits. There's one thing that's out there. It's called a super fund site. So if your company has a super fund, if a company you're buying has a super fund site, you are responsible for that super fund site and you could be required to pay billions of dollars for it. Of course, if you buy the land also, you're going to have that. So what you want to do is you buy the company, you buy specific assets of the company and leave those old defective assets some in, in the, with a buyer so, and let them worry about it. So let's look at some pictures here. When you buy common stock, there's a parent subsidiary relationship. But if you buy the assets, then you are just going to get all of the assets that belong to the sub. And maybe you would leave them in a branch division, maybe not, but it's all going to be one company and all of the subsidiary assets become part of your company and it's all in one corporation. So again, these were the figures that we were looking at. Again, remember statutory merger. Let's just review one more time. Statutory merger would be where B's assets get mixed in with A and therefore only AA company survives. A statutory consolidation, you create a new company, CC, and all of AA and BB's assets get put into CC. With a stock acquisition, AA company buys the stock of BB company and therefore you have a parent that owns a subsidiary and two separate corporations. Okay, now by a statutory merger, which again would be this arrangement here, this can be done in a friendly way or it can be done in an unfriendly way. And truth is, you could do this as a stock acquisition too. I don't know why they just frame this as a statutory merger. A friendly merger would be you just make a deal with the company and you buy those assets. You maybe you buy all the assets. By a hostile takeover, you you buy the stock on the open market, and you encourage the stockholders to sell you the stock, even though management and perhaps the board are opposed to your acquisition. And you could do that to the point where you buy most of the stock and you force the remaining stockholders um, to sell their stock too. So then you get, you cannot liquidate the subsidiary unless you own 100% of the stock. There can't be any non-controlling interest. So you can liquidate the subsidiary and affect a statutory merger if you buy a certain percentage of the stock, way more than a majority, I don't know how much, 
and then you force the remaining shareholders to sell their stock also. And it could be you could force them to say cash or you could force them into a stock for stock acquisition where they have to exchange their their subsidiary stock for the parent company stock. But the idea there would again be that there's one legal entity surviving. I think it's pretty difficult to mount a hostile takeover as a statutory merger um, because it's difficult to get legal permission to force the non-controlling interest to sell you their stock. So, um, but the book tells you about it, so I'm telling you about it. It could happen. A stock, um, in this situation, in a peaceful merger, basically, A gives a certain amount of stock or cash to T. T gives over its assets to A. And then that stock, that A stock or the cash, goes to the T shareholder. So T no longer exists. What emerges is just A and A shareholders and now T shareholders own A corporation. Now with a hostile takeover, A corporation would convince T shareholders to sell their stock. And they would do it either with cash or with the stock for stock. They would ex convince them to exchange their T corp shit stock for A corp stock instead. So enough T shareholders need to do this to where A corp is going to acquire a majority ownership of T. And then eventually you have just one company. Now this could also be done as a st statutory consolidation. You can have a hostile takeover with a statutory too. Also, I believe you're going to create a new company and they're going to issue stock to the two combining companies. And then that stock is going to go to the shareholders. And then the two companies will be liquidated into the new company. So there's only one company left. Let's look at the pictures here. So what will happen is new company, that's the new company, is going to send its stock to the two old companies in exchange for their assets. And then the new company's stock is going to go to the old company shareholders. So when you're all done, X and Y shareholders only own the stock of new, co new company. Another option is a holding company. And this is a little more common, especially in a hostile takeover. And they don't show it here, but it, it's just more common. Similar to a statutory consolidation, the two companies are not liquidated into newly formed parent corporation. Instead, the new company issues its stock to the shareholders of the two existing companies in exchange for their stock. So here, you would have new co-corp and X and Y are separate. And new co-corp gives their, their stock to X and Y shareholders. And then it gives its stock and then it becomes the owner of X and Y. In essence, Nuco buys out the shareholders and then it exchanges for its stock. Um, a way to force out a target company's dissenting shareholders is to use A, acquisition accounting, B, pooling of interest accounting, C, statutory merger, D, statutory consolidation, or E, none of the above. The answer is statutory merger. Um, between you and me, it's not a great question because I believe you can do this as a statutory consolidation also. So um, that's just not a great, not a great question.